Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey It's your take We've been joined by a Bristol mayor, we've been joined by musicians, a cricket commentator. Today, we're joined by an actor. I'm your host, James Ewan, for another edition of Your Take. Your path, your perspective. An acting masterclass today on Your Take. I'm joined by a performer who has worked on both stage and screen. My guest is from the West Country and became a familiar face in the 1990s on ITV West. He's written scripts and comedy sketches, performed for years in the Southwest in Panto. He's a regular performer with improvisational group called Instant Wit and interviewed the likes of Dame Edna, Shirley MacLaine and the Spice Girls. Today, he's your takes guest a warm welcome to actor, writer, and comedian, John Mooney. Mooney. John Mooney. <laughs> trust, trust me. Trust me. I was waiting for it. No, it's fine. I was waiting for you to fall into that huge elephant trap of, of my surname. It's, uh, it, was, it was a brave effort. <laughs> good, mor good morning. How are you? You well? I'm very well. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks uh, for joining us uh, today for, for your take. We like to turn the clock back many years to the to the past, but we're going to start in current time. So so now, obviously, a, a difficult twelve months for any but anyone who's a, a performer in uh, performing arts with theatres closed and heavy restriction on television sets and and so on. What have you been doing in the the last twelve months? Have you can you diversify as a performer? Has it been pretty difficult? Um, yeah, well, no, it, it's been tough uh, for anybody. Oh, anyway, it's been tough for the for the entire country, the entire world. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly, if you if you're an actor or a, or a performer, you know, comedian or singer, etc., and 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 you make your living performing, especially sort of live performance, then there has been no outlet for that apart from you know Zoom shares in Zoom. Why don't we? Why didn't we all buy those? Um, so yeah, it's been tricky, and you know, some people. I guess, I guess people d uh, respond to it in their own way. Some people have learnt new languages or how to play the ukulele and uh, you know bake bread and things and, and speak Mandarin. Um, I've pretty much hidden under the duvet. Um, uh, I've done a bit of writing. I've had a, yes, a few scripts I've been working on, which I've sort of returned to. Uh, uh, I think you do whatever you do to to get yourself through it, really. Um, uh, I tend to um, <laughs> draw the curtains <laughs> and wait for the air raid siren to finish. Okay. Um, obviously, things now are, are starting to to change with restrictions loosening uh, from this week, sort of onwards. With that kind of in mind, has um, has work started to to come in now? Is have you noticed a, a change? Yeah, there is a change. I mean, it's very, very slow. Obviously, theatres reopened this week, and I'm delighted. You know, some friends of mine are you know back on stage performing. Um, I'm thrilled, thrilled for them and for the industry. But it's nowhere near back to normal. If you see people say we're back, well, we're back in a very small way in terms of theatre. TV and film has continued for a while. It has been going because the government put in a an insurance scheme so that if productions had to close down due to COVID. They were they were covered financially. They didn't extend that scheme to, to the theatre industry, um, which made it much much harder. Um, but yes, no auditions have slowly started again. Um, strangely, I did an all you know it's all self tape now because it's very difficult to get into the audition room because of COVID. Although they they are returning, so you do these self tapes at home. Uh, I did one the other week um, uh, and I got the part. So I was up in London earlier this week um, having uh, meetings about that. And I've just my age, just before this meeting, my agent phoned me and said, right, I've got another audition for you, which I've got to do this afternoon. Um, rearrange the living room, turn into a studio. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's slowly, slowly getting back, but it's, um, I think we're still some way away. Obviously a, a difficult question to, to answer, but do you think 
it would be changed forever, the, the industry, particularly stage, which is kind of a, an area that you kind of work in mostly. Yeah, you think, uh, I don't, well, I don't I mean, the thing is about stage is it, or theatre is it, it, its whole, its whole reason, its whole appeal is, is live performance on a stage in front of a physical audience, all feeling and sharing and experiencing the laughter and the tears and the, and the drama at the same time. It's, it's a communal shared experience and that's what makes it so powerful. And obviously during the pandemic, there have been theater productions which have been, which have been streamed. Um, great, fantastic, a way of keeping the arts alive and, and uh, keeping things bubbling bubbling under, but it's not theater. I don't think it's, it's not the theater experience of, of sitting in an audience and, that expectation when the lights go down at half seven or whatever it is and, uh, and the audience falls quiet, someone's phone goes off and everyone tuts, uh, you know, that, 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 you miss that. Um, so I, I'm hoping that theatre, once we're back to, you know, normality, that um, theatre remains as unchanged as possible. Fingers crossed. We're going to move on from the current time and, and move back to the, the past. And I want to discuss your early life to, to begin with, but for many years you've been synonymous with the Southwest, having worked on ITV West and performed on the, the stage. Uh, were you born in, in Bristol? And I just want to ask you a little bit about family life grow, growing up. I was born in Bradford-on-Avon, which is a small town uh, just outside of Bath, and I now live about three miles from there. So I've not gone far. Perhaps they forgot to cut the umbilical cord. Um, I, so I'm, I'm still in I'm still in Wiltshire, and my um, my parents are half an hour away. My sister is five minutes away. Uh, it's miserable. <laughs> um, so no, I, I'm I'm not a, I'm not a city person. I mean, I, I studied up in London, you know, uh, after school. I went there for three four years, um, and you know, I go up to London every now and again, or obviously not not of late, but but. Uh, London is the sort of entertainment, theatre, acting, TV centre of the country, although people rail against it being so London-centric. It is. That's the, that's the situation. And I think London's a lovely place to visit, exciting, go up the West End, see a show, but I'm always itching to get back to, um, to the countryside, really. Bath. I know Bath really well. Uh, went to school in Bath and the theatre all in Bath. And Bath is about as big as a place as I'm sort of comfortable with. I find places bigger than that, a little bit overwhelming. Bristol's huge. I don't really know, Bri I know pockets of Bristol, uh, but how they all link up these various communities. Oh, I always get a bit confused. So Bristol's, I find, again, enormous. Can we come on to the, the acting? I want to find out what got you interested in acting. And just wanted to find out, was there a connection with a, a family member that was maybe involved in the creative industries or who was your kind of earliest inspiration for you wanting to follow this kind of career goal? Um, well, certainly no family members uh, uh, that I'm aware of who are uh, you know, performers or actors or writers or whatever. I, I think as with most people who, who attempt to do this kind of thing for a living, it's, it's simply something you just discover makes you tick. Uh, um, and I pretty much discovered that in, in school days that I was, uh, I, I mean, I was never one of the cool kids. I was never in that group. I was never one of the geeks. I was never in that group. I was kind of a floating voter. I was kind of accepted by both because I was I was funny, I guess. Um, you know, I, ma I made my uh, classmates laugh. I made teachers laugh. I did the school plays. That's what I was sort of known for. I was always picked last for the football teams, but I was always cast first for the <laughs> for the school plays that was my niche and, and and I guess if you feel comfortable there then then you realize this is um this is the path you 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 want to pursue so but but nobody you know I didn't follow anybody um and I don't really remember any inspirations uh it's just where I felt most comfortable sure you, you went on to um study drama theatre arts at Goldsmiths College and the, the University of London. Can you just tell us a bit about your experience there, what you, what you learned? Well, I learned very little. Um, London was a shock. I, I, you know, sure. I, this is the absolute truth. Before I went to London, um, I'd never been on a bus before in my life because I'd always lived in, I mean, where I live now is a, is a village of about 3,000 people, uh, apart from living in London and Bath. 
I've lived in other villages far smaller than this. Uh, and, uh, and up until my um, university days, I'd never, I'd always lived in little hamlets, you know, mm. a, a pig in a post box and the, the pig goes away at weekends, uh, tiny places. And, and so when I went to London, I'd never been on a bus because we had no bus service in our community. And I thought they were like trains. I thought they stopped at every stop. Or to, I didn't know you had to ring a bell. That was, that was, um, that was a very quick, steep learning curve as we went sailing past the, the university. And I thought, what? Uh, um, so uh, yeah, so London and the Tube and and um, and just the diversity of the community—it was all in a, a bit of a culture shock for me. Uh, and I think I struggled with it a little bit. Um, I was—I'm very shy. I'm a very shy person, always have been. Um, and I was in halls of residence for my first year at university, and it was only in the last week that I found out what my next door neighbor's name was, um, because I, I wouldn't come out of my room. I, I, uh, my parents paid for my halls, uh, which also included meals in the halls. You got your, your evening meal there. I never ate there once, not once. I remember on the very first day, the induction day, I turned up to the meeting about 10 minutes late because I was nervous. And I walked in and I saw a throng of young, thriving, happy, upbeat, outgoing people. And I turned on my heel and went back to my room. And I ate fish and chips from the local fish and chip shop for a year because I just couldn't face meeting these people and, mm. and introducing them. I, I find it terrifying. I still do. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, university was a, was a, they say it's the happiest days of your life. Um, I, I profoundly and strongly disagree, but I it was share, fine. I share some of that sentiment as well. Um, interestingly, I've heard lots of stories of particularly actors saying that they're quite introverted as people and, and quite shy. So for you, going on the stage, collaborating with, with other actors, doing the improvisation as well, you're, you're big into improvisation. For you, is that is that your way of kind of bringing something out with, with your personality or? I guess so. How I does mean, it I don't, kind of I've, work? Yeah, I don't, I've, I've never really delved into it too deeply. I mean, I, it's a cliche, isn't it? The, the whole... Mm. Um, introverted actor thing, and then you and then you go on stage demanding adulation and applause. Um, uh, I, I, I guess there's that slight thing about finding it easier to be somebody else than to be myself. I'm more comfortable playing a part uh, than than. Um, and I mean, even when I was a television presenter, you're still playing a role. You're still playing a heightened version of yourself. You, you know, you don't come home and say. Hello, darling. It's dinner at six thirty, and then we'll have the traffic and travel. I mean, you know, so you're still putting on a performance, um, and I guess that's just where I—I I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know the reasoning behind it. I've, I've never, as I said, dug too deeply in case I discover that I'm an asshole. Interestingly, um, you say about the the introverted side, but do you find there's a, a fear factor that before you go on stage or? before you do a, a piece to, to camera, are you extremely nervous, but when, you know, the cameras are rolling, when the stage curtain opens, do you feel totally comfortable in that, that situation, yeah, in that moment? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm nervous meeting people. You know, when I went up to these meetings in London just this week, I was meeting new people, slightly out of my comfort zone. I found that quite intimidating and, and, and anxiety inducing. I guess familiarity, um, makes things more comfortable. So, for example, uh, when it's opening night of the pantomime, and, and I've you know performed there for for twenty years, um, I am I am uh, there's adrenaline going, so I'm I'm sort of pumped up a little bit. Um, you know, I'm aware of what's happening. I'm at a heightened reality, but I wouldn't say I was nervous because I mm. because I know every nook and cranny of that stage and every twist and turn of the corridors backstage. So I I, I guess um, yeah, familiarity helps. Um, but but uh, I think you need to have some degree of some degree of nerves or tension or, or you know you can't just snooze and sleep sleepwalk your way on stage. Um, I wanted to talk about cool. you graduating in 1993 because you went to mm -hmm. form on a form a, a successful sketch comedy act uh, called Avon and Mooney. Can you just tell us about the the type of material you, you performed? Yes, yeah, you got both names wrong then. So that was a, that, that's 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 extraordinary. 
<laughs> I'm going to send you a prize. Um, Avon to Moni. Yeah, no, Graham, Graham Avon uh, was my best friend at school. He still is one of my very best friends. Um, and uh, I went off to London to study drama. He went to Manchester. Uh, and then we, uh, after that, we both uh, graduated, we, we kind of attempted to form a double act. And we won a, a couple of competitions and played a few clubs and things. Um, and then uh, Graham basically fell in love and and uh, with somebody who earned a lot more money than an out of work actor and and uh, sort of was aiming to you know heading towards that family life and settling down and uh, decided that he, you know, he needed a, a, a different career uh, that's how I see it he might see it slightly differently so we kind of went our separate ways sure. um, and, that, and at that point I fell into television um, and then we get back together every now and again and we do little we do things and sketches every, every now and again, not not very often anymore. And we did Edinburgh a few years ago just because we'd always wanted to do it. So we finally scratched that itch uh, and had fun with it. But he's a delightful man. He's a very funny man. I, I, you know, I, I, I love him like a brother, but we, um, it, yeah, it never really quite worked out for us in that respect. But I don't think we, we, we didn't really give it long enough. Over the course of your career, you've worked across many different mediums including stage, which we've already mentioned, uh, television and, and radio. Do you have a, a particular favourite and a particular favourite project that you've worked on? Um, I, 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 I like things which are live, I guess. That's, that's always a, anything where I have to think on my feet gives me a bit of a, a, bit of a kick. Um, so be that, you know, uh, stage performance or... Um, or I, felt I did a lot of live television uh, in my day, a lot of outside broadcasts or, or, or live quiz shows at one point. Uh, and that was fun because you were, you were sort of slightly flying by the seat of your pants. Um, if it's all pre-recorded, you know, or, or on a TV or on a film set, it's an awful lot of hanging around and you do it and hopefully you get it right. But if a car alarm goes off in the background or a light fails or, or you know, somebody sneezes, you just stop and do it again. So that, 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 that edge of jeopardy is somewhat removed. Um, so I, yeah, I, if it's live, then, then it, that, that's, uh, that's quite a, a thrill, really. You mentioned, um, television and I said at the beginning of the interview that you were synonymous with, um, ITV West going back to the, the 1990s. And I remember fondly, uh, a project you worked on trip on trip in the cosmic buggy. Can you just talk about your days, um, back in the 90s with ITV West? Yeah, of course. Uh, that, was a, that was a fun show, A Trip in the Cosmic Buggy. Um, I, mean, we, I look back on it now and, and realise just how lucky we were as a team. I, I tend to work with the same producer and director, a few people there, um, a lot, because um, we were given carte blanche. We were just told, right, you've got the 11 o'clock slot on a Thursday night go and make something, do what you want. You know, we had, we had pretty much uh, full creative, um, full creative limits, you know, we could do whatever we wanted, um, which is, a, you know, an extraordinary gift. I don't think that would happen now. Um, and it's a shame that regional TV has died out pretty much because back then uh, ITV West or HTV as they were before, it was part of their license, their remit, and they had to do a what's on program. They had to do a sports program, a kids program, a news program, a politics program that was written into their contract. And that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but a, a Trip in the Cosmic Buggy was a very surreal nightclub program where I was pretending to be the security guard at HTV. And when the boss left at the end of the day, I would open up the big scene dock at the back and turn the studios into a nightclub. And the guy playing, who played the boss of ITV West was the boss of ITV West, Jeremy Payne. He played himself. I played the security guard. Uh, and, then I, and then I let all my mates in and we turned the studio into a nightclub. And we had Graham Purchase, who was a sort of local newsreader, um, very sort of you know, quintessentially British BBC. We turned him into a, into a nightclub guru uh, and made him say all the, the most awful things. He had no idea what he was saying. <laughs> but it was fun to write um, and people loved it. And, I, and I, I used to think it's my witty script and my dashing presentation skills. And then I realized it's actually, it's a, it's a lot of tits and arse at 11 o'clock when people come back from the pub, that's why they're watching. Um, and and uh, I think that was the secret of his success. It's interesting that you, you mentioned the whole thing about local television because 
it was a, a big thing back in the day, like local broadcasting. And like you said, they had to um, come up with um, the content and uh, an amount of output as well. Why do you think that's almost non-existent now? Well, it wasn't profitable, I think, you know, sadly, as with most things in, in, in life, if not the entertainment industry, it all comes down to money. Um, uh, regional television programmes you can't sell to anyone else because they're only pertinent to your region. They normally have a time limit on them so that they can't really be repeated. So um, so slowly the ITV regions, I mean, it feels, at the time it seemed like it happened overnight, but I'm sure it didn't happen over a few years, but the, the regions slowly sort of coalesced into one, and then it basically became Granada and Carlton or something like that. You know, I, we, we, we mixed with West Country and then it became ITV West Country and then Meridian disappeared and then Central disappeared and everything sort of merged into one and it's now just ITV. And all the, all the regionals, uh, all the regional centres do is to, they just do their news bulletins, which pretty much cover, certainly down here, so almost go all, all the way down to Southampton and across to Wales and Reading. It's a huge area now. So it's, it's really not very specific to the, to the, to the uh, viewer. Um, uh, and it's a shame. I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a money, monetary thing, I guess, whether it will return or not, because I think regional news and regional programming has a, has a value uh, and, and a service to perform to, um, to the people who watch. You say it was an interesting period because you kind of felt living in a, a city or living in the, the West Country, in Bristol, or the outskirts, that a lot of these people that were cropping up in the, the shows, like yourself, you had people like Sherry Eugene, mm. uh, Sam Mason. They almost became like, I suppose in a way, kind of local celebrities that you would see regularly yeah. on news programs, sketch shows. It, it was great. Yeah, and I'm, I actually, I would, my time there was slightly behind its heyday. I mean, in the, sort of the 80s, HTV West had its own helicopter and would fly Richard Wyatt into the Shepton Malik, you know, ground and things. And, and yeah. What, enormous, there was much more money in television in the 80s. I kind of missed that, that heyday, my, my time there. Um, but you're right, but we were doing creative things. I mean, we had a show once called BS1, um, <laughs> which was like a spoof regional news show. It only ran for one series. I think it was way ahead of its time. <laughs> That's the way I'm excusing it now. Um, but it was a spoof regional news program. And we, I had a revolving desk, which had these four clocks on the front. And you know that stereotypical image of a 70s newsroom where we'll have the, a row of clocks saying that the time in Tokyo, New York, Paris, London or whatever. I had these four clocks on my desk which just said Long Ashton, Trowbridge, <laughs> Melsham, Yeovil and they all said the same time and it, and it just amused us uh, and, and um, we, were, we were mocking ourselves as much as anything um, and again we were just allowed to get away with, with murder effectively, not literally. But... So fun times. I used to enjoy the um, the late night live um, political yes. show, which I think Edwina Curry was on at. Uh, at yeah, she day. hosted a, a, a I think a later incarnation of that. Yeah, but Dave Barrett used to do it with Sam Mason, I think, because they used to have a huge studio at HTV, um, big big studio where they would do Question Time uh, would, would be broadcast from there, and then the studio was turned into offices uh, whilst I was there. Um, and, you know, and, and again, they used to make things like Robin of Sherwood and they used to do feature films there at HTV, big productions. And it just slowly sort of folded in on itself. Um, You've um, another string to your bow has been in the hot seat as a, an interviewer. And you've interviewed many people in the, the public eye from Shirley MacLaine to Gene Wilder to Dame Edna and the Spice Girls. Do you have um, a journalistic background and... Kind of what what did you learn from being an interviewer um uh to listen to the interviewee i guess is the is always the big one um no i, I mean it was, it was part of my job i used to do a what's on program um and i did a film review program as well for uh meridian did I, I worked for them quite a lot um and so i used to get sent to a lot of uh press junkets uh, uh, up to the uh, Dorchester up in london to interview big film stars and, and pop bands and things um, and, you know, and if you're a TV presenter, you're interviewing people all the time, basically. Uh, but they were fun. They were, yeah, it was, it was lovely to meet some, some you know, big names, uh, even if it's, you just got your six minute slot in the Dorchester suite. It was always quite a surreal experience. Um, and, and sometimes they went better than others. 
Some tricky, tricky moments then. Yeah, I remember. I remember Shirley MacLaine. She'd done a. She'd done a sequel to um, Terms of Endearment, a film called The Morning Star, I think. And you had to go and see it beforehand uh, before you did the interview. You weren't allowed to interview it unless you'd seen the film. So they sent you along to see the film. Uh, and then I went up to do the interview, and you sort of sat in a holding room with all the other local uh, TV journalists or presenters. Um, and I do feel sorry for the celebrities, the actors, because they must they must spend days doing this, being asked the same question over and over again. And I guess some deal with it better than others. And it came to my six minute slot and I was taken out of the room and I was taken up to sort of Shirley MacLaine's suite. And I had to wait outside the door whilst the interview in front of me was being conducted. And it was a lady from this morning, I recall. And I just remember the woman saying, Shirley MacLaine, it's a pleasure to meet you. Tell me, what's your new film about? And I heard Shirley MacLaine say, I refuse to answer that question, it's so stupid. And there was a pause and a clearing of her throat. And then I heard the woman try again and she said, Shirley MacLaine, a pleasure to meet you. Tell me about your character in your new film. <laughs> and Shirley MacLaine said, I refuse to answer that fucking question. I'm still in shock over the first. Uh, and, and her PA sort of turned to me and went, she's not in a good mood. <laughs> Don't be obvious. I think she was bored of the obvious questions. So I, I went in there and, and accused her of stealing furniture. We had a very bizarre conversation and she loved it. And we got on like a house on fire. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess roll with the punches is another lesson I learned. You mentioned um, many times in the, the interview, your, your love of the stage, which is your, your favorite medium to work in, but you've been well known for your performances in pantomime, uh, particularly with the bath. Theatre Royal uh, over the Christmas periods for, for many years. What is it you love about Panto? Well, it's got to be the paycheck. Um, no, it's, it's, it's the kids. Uh, what do I love about Panto? It's, it's enormous fun. It's, it's such a silly way to, to earn a living. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit um, uh, trite about it. I'm, I'm very grateful to it. Um, yeah, it's enormous fun. It is children's first introduction to theatre, so it does serve a, a, a quite serious purpose in int introducing children to live performance. And if they get a kick from it and a thrill from it, maybe they'll pursue it. They'll come back again and again and again, and they'll take their own family, and it becomes a traditional thing. Uh, mm. uh, and, it's, and that's a, something quite beautiful and powerful um, that pantomime can, can deliver. Um, as a performer, you get a chance to do everything. You get to do a bit of acting, you get to do a bit of singing, you get to do a bit of dancing, slapstick, verbal comedy, wordplay. Um, it's a real sort of crash course of, of, of all forms and styles of performance. And you don't really get that anywhere else. Um, you know, if you're doing Shakespeare, it's all pretty serious, or you're doing Pinter, whatever. Uh, although you don't mess around as much as people think we do in pantomime, it is heavily scripted, it's far less ad-libbed than people seem to think, um, you know, but no two performances are ever the same because um, because the audience also pays, plays such a large part in a pantomime performance. The, the audience is a is a equal cast member and we want them to shout out and we want them to, to, to do the responses. And a Friday night audience can be very different to a Sunday matinee audience. Sometimes you have to work much harder to get, to get them on your side and, and shouting out. But when they're going for it and when you look at the the kids and you see them screaming along and you think, yep, we've got them in the palm of our hand. It's, it's, it's enormous fun. There's a scene, there's a ghost gag, a very famous panto routine, you sit on a bench and a ghost appears and everybody screams, it's behind you. Um, and when you've got hundreds of school children and families bellowing in your face, it's behind, and you see these kids on the front row, purple, it's behind, they, they, are, they are so, engrossed and emotionally involved in that moment. It's fantastic. I mean, you can't beat it. I wanted to come on to something that you just mentioned about the audience. And you mentioned that um, audiences can be very different. You know, a matinee audience can be totally different to, um, you know, the evening performance show. As a performer, when a, an audience aren't necessarily reacting or the way you kind of want them to, what can you do as a performer to, to try and kind of change that atmosphere? That must be um, difficult. Not a lot. Uh, I mean, the great Chris Harris, um, who was sort of my mentor for many years, and, and you know, a, 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 a true pantomime star. I mean, he really knew what he was, what he was doing. 
he would say, you know, he turned to you in the wings and you go, well, these are the ones you get paid for. These are, these are hard work. The other ones are fun. You know, they're, they're, they're just a joy and a gift, but these, these are the ones you get paid for. Uh, and you can't necessarily pander to it. You can't, you know, you can't wait for the laughs. You just, you just push on through, you know, and if you finish five minutes earlier because nobody laughed, well, that's an extra cup of tea in, in, in the interval. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, I don't know what you, I mean, you, you, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. It's, 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 I mean, but I remember also sometimes things happen. I remember, uh, the very first panther, was it the first one I did? Yeah, I think it was. And Patsy Palmer, who played Bianca in EastEnders at the time, it was a big, big name. Um, she was our Cinderella and she went off one, one night. And so just before the show goes up, the house lights goes down, it goes over the tannoy. Ladies and gentlemen, for this evening's performance, the part of Cinderella will be played by, and it was played by one of the, uh, one of the girl, girl dancers. Um, so somebody, you know, beautiful, wonderful, talented woman, but somebody in the audience didn't know and hadn't paid to see. And they find out that Patsy Palmer isn't performing and the whole audience goes, oh. And that's what you hear over the tenor, oh, just before you start the show. And then it's really hard work because you spend the first half hour just trying to get them to forget that Patsy Palmer isn't there and, you know, and, and to give you a break and a chance. By the end of it, they loved it. They wouldn't have known she wasn't there. Um, so I think you just have to stick to your guns and, and trust in yourself and the material. And um, sometimes if they're not up for it, they're lost. You mentioned um, Chris Harris, who you worked with for, uh, I think it was uh, 11 years I, I read. I'd seen Chris in, in Panto many years as a, a young lad. So brilliant as a pantomime dame, his comic timing. What was it like working with him for that longer period and kind of what did you learn from one another? Oh, well, I learned everything from him. I mean... He, he, yeah, he was a joy. He was a joy to as a, as a performer and just as a human being. He he was a wonderful, kind, nurturing, encouraging human. The kind of person you aspire to be, but I'm I'm just not a nice enough person to be as good a human being as as he was. Um, he had yeah time for everyone, be it a fellow cast member or box office staff, technician, theatre cleaner. His dressing room door was always open. Um, yeah, lovely man. Um, and I just wished to watch him. You know, even scenes that I wasn't in. There were certain routines he'd do. I would leave my dressing room and go and stand in the wings and just watch him do these little bits of business because he just had them so exquisitely timed. You thought, how is he doing that? What's he doing with his feet at that moment? He doesn't move him with his hands and he gets a laugh. What's he doing? So I would watch him and I would study him. Uh, and, and, and I don't know what it was about me that he liked. Our first for Panto we did together, he wasn't the director. We were sort of thrown together. But there was, some, and then subsequently he, he came back as the director and used to ask for me. So I want, I want John back, I want to do it with, with him. And we became comic and dame and often a mother and son relationship. So there was something about me that he liked and, and I don't, I, and we never discussed it. We never ever, we never talked about it. Um, and, and, and I remember doing something on stage, ad living something. And then he said something back and then I said something and it got a huge laugh. And there was a little shared glint in our eyes. And then we came off stage and we never discussed it. We never said, oh, and tomorrow night you do this and then I'll do that. And, and we, it was a very generic, natural relationship. Um, and I adored him. And, uh, and yeah, I, I still miss him. Um, um, and, and I think the audiences, you know, were very lucky to have been treated to such a, a fine performer. We move on from pantomime to improvisation. And I wanted to talk about your work leading workshops on improvisation and also performing with uh, a group called Instant Wit. What is it you like about improvisation? Well, again, it's the thinking on your feet thing. You know, it's, um, it's, there is no show until the, the, the show starts. You have, a, you have an outline, a series of games and sketches you're going to perform. And then we take the audience suggestions in that whose line is it anyway fashion. And away we go. And it's kind of terrifying. Um, but it keeps you sharp. Um, you know, it, it's sort of, it's, I think it's a good exercise for, for actors to, to put themselves through. Some people hate it. And there's some very fine actors hate improvisation. I mean, I used to watch, I used to adore Whose Line Is It Anyway? Uh, as, a, as a kid and a teenager, I taped every single episode. Um, VH, stacks of VHSs of Whose Line and I'd watch them endlessly. Um, and I remember uh, Stephen Fry 
being on it and, and sort of struggling with it, doing a very funny rap about a sheep. He was clearly slightly out of his um, out of his comfort zone. And, and apparently the producers tried for years to get Rowan Atkinson. And Rowan Atkinson would say, I can't do it. I, I, I'm, I work with a script and he's very detailed and everything is, is rehearsed to the nth degree. And, and he's superb. I mean, he's one of the greats. But I think it, it suits some people better than others. And I, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, uh, and uh, strangely, one of my colleagues in Instant Wit tends to get sometimes a bit, a bit nervous beforehand and sort of said to me, why, why aren't you nervous? And, uh, and my answer was, how can you be nervous about something which doesn't exist yet? We're yet to make it up. Um, and, and, that's, and it's a kind of a bit of a weak answer, but it's what I cling to. When I, when I start to feel nervous, I go, well, don't be, because there is nothing. There's nothing to be nervous about. We haven't made it up yet. For the people who are watching who've not come across Instant Wit, can you tell us a bit about how the kind of shows work and how you got involved with them? I think I, how I got involved with it, I approached them. I'd seen them. They used to be an earlier in, uh, incarnation of the group and they were called More Fool Us, I think. And previous members are people like Ruth Jones, Rob Ryden, um, uh, oh, the woman who did Nighty Night, uh, Julia Davis uh, was also in the group. So, um, uh, and I'd seen them and I loved it. I thought, oh, that's what I want to do. I've always you know, wanted to do Who's Liners anyway. Um, and so I, I approached them and I, I got an audition. So basically there's four of us, there's about a dozen in the group, but every show has a mixture of four performers. So they, they mix us up all the time. So three actors and a musician. Um, and then we play these improvised games where we get suggestions from the audience either to shout them out or they write them down on bits of paper. The audience can take part as, as much or as little as they wish. We don't, we don't go around with a cattle prod making people interact. Um, they veto that idea. Um, and, and, then, and then we, we yeah, and then we try to make people laugh for, for um, a couple of hours, sometimes horribly unsuccessfully. But then you, 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 but then you own that moment. You know, if it all goes horribly wrong, you, 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 if you die on stage, then die on stage with confidence and with a laugh and, and with, you know, a bit of pizzazz and then the audience will forgive you. Like yourself, I used to love um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? I think it was Ryan Stiles. I used to... Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, highly yeah. entertaining. But do you have kind of like the, the host figure, like the, the Clive Anderson who kind of comes up no no we don't we don't have that role we, we all sort of share we all introduce different formats and, and we share that role um yeah it's difficult to it's difficult to put that that person into a live show sometimes um uh, without it looking slightly like you've all sort of agreed things before um i mean there are other improvisation troops and i know for a fact that what they do is is it's not quite as improvised as it would perhaps sometimes appear we we literally and genuinely have nothing planned you know nothing at all um uh, nothing up our sleeves to, to to pull out should we need to um and that probably shows improvisation now to a an animated television series moomin valley where you perform a, a voice for that particular program is that the first animation project you worked on and how did you find the experience yeah, I'd never done that before. I mean, I've done, you know, all through my all through my career, I've done bits of voice work, be them local advert voiceovers, a bit of radio, you know, that kind of thing. I voiced over a few television programs. Uh, I'd never done a, a, an animation thing. I, I got an, did I get an, did I audition for? I don't think I did. Um, yeah, no, it's enormous fun. And and um, strangely, the the director of that uh, series, uh, Steve Box, who won an Oscar for Wallace and Gromit. Um, I worked with him again recently for a, a, a big project, which I've had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So I, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Um, and and as, I don't know if it's ever going to happen or whatever, but what I was doing, I was recording something called the scratch voice or the scratch vocal. So I was recording the voices for all these um, characters, but I will be replaced by famous people. Um, I was simply recording the, the rough draft of the, of the script to help the animators make the film. Uh, and once they've finished all the animation, my, I will be revoiced by, by, I don't know, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch or something. I'm hoping they might just give me a tiny part. Um, uh, so I had to do all these parts uh, and I, I learned so much. I had to do something called Waller. I'd never heard of Waller. Can you give us a bit of Waller? Um, and there's a bit, there's a bit in the scene uh, where there's somebody up a ladder and the ladder is being shaken 
and and so they wanted a bit of and you know so you but you have to sort of physicalize it in order to get the um, and you do that for hours and it's it's quite exhausting because you're trying to put all of this story just through your voice because you, you know doesn't matter how much you wave your arms and pull any faces that won't be seen it's just your voice but you have to sort of physicalize it um so it was a it was a very strange and enjoyable experience i loved it i'd, lo I'd like to do more of it acting's obviously a, a very competitive and, and difficult business to to break into and there's also long period periods with no work what would your advice be to any young actors looking for a, a lucky break well, it's interesting that you said, uh, you know, about the long periods of, of, of no work. I can't remember who said it, but there is an actor who said something like, um, you know, your, your longevity, uh, the longevity of your career as an actor often is more dependent on how you deal with being out of work than how you deal with being in work. Um, uh, because, you know, and, you know, the people that you see, all the, the big names, the, the, the stars, the people that you see on stage and on the screen and stage all the time, that tiny, tiny percent, you know, they're the very lucky ones, uh, but, you know, that's not the situation for the vast majority of, of, of actors and performers. So um, I, I would, my advice would be, it's not a race. Um, um, you know, don't compare your career or your journey to anybody else's. It's, it's very difficult not to sometimes to think, why, why are they doing that and I'm not? Why is this not working out for me? But it, it, it's not a race. Um, uh, comparison is the, is the thief of joy, as they say. So just enjoy your own journey. And if it came down to, to, to very practical advice, it would be learn your lines and don't be late, um, which sounds obvious, but, but sometimes isn't for some people. Learn your lines and don't be late, and then you should be okay. We come down to my favourite part of your take, the final... Is it the end? The final, yeah, the final 12 <laughs> questions. I always enjoy uh, the answers uh, to these. This is kind of some quick fire questions. Firstly, can I ask you, what's your favorite pastime? I thought you could say password. I thought I'm not telling you that. Um, <laughs> my, my, fa <laughs> my favorite password <laughs> time. Um, I don't really have any. I doodle. I like to draw. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a decent-ish. My grandfather was a painter. Uh, and did calligraphy and things. And that, okay. that, that sort of found its way to me. My, my dad can barely draw breath, but I, 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 can, I, can, I can doodle and cartoon and things. And, and, I, and I, I entertain myself with that for if nobody else. Yeah. Okay, so from sketching now to your favorite film and why? Uh, that probably changes, you know, hourly. Um, uh, favorite film, I love the Coen Brothers films. There's a film they did called uh, Miller's Crossing, which, just I thought was extraordinary. Love that film, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Tootsie. Um, uh, I, 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 and I don't know why, I, I'm not a big fan of special effects and superhero movies. I, I like storytelling, I guess. Um, anything by the Coen brothers gets, gets a thumbs up from me. Thumbs up from me as well. And I do like Gabriel Byrne as an actor. I find yeah, he's little, fabulous in- A little bit, in, um, little bit underrated. Yeah, he does, yeah he's in, and perhaps underused as well, isn't he? Um, Very much so. Uh, but he's fabulous in that film. Uh, uh, and Tom, Tom and Leo, Albert Finney. Yeah, some, there's some, just some iconic scenes in it. From the medium of film to novels now, who's your favourite novelist? That's easy. That's Robert Harris, um, who writes sort of historical novels. Uh, his Cicero trilogy about the uh, sort of the Roman period is, is astonishing. Fatherland was his first book. Again, uh, Wonderful piece. Um, yeah, I, that's what I like. If you weren't an actor, what other profession would you have liked to have done? Um, uh, I look terrific in blue, so perhaps the police force, um, but probably uh, probably a teacher. I, that, that sort of uh, appeals. Not the paperwork or the politics, but the the, the passing on of knowledge and, and working with young uh, young minds and sort of that that sort of role. That, that's, that sounds a worthwhile way to spend your life. Who in life has been your greatest inspiration? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I struggle with this question when you, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I'm in my family, uh, my, my husband, uh, you know, um, Chris Harris. Yeah, I, I don't have one specific 
individual that I that I that I sort of would credit in that role. I don't know. I guess my parents um, they they shape you, um, rightly or wrongly. Do you read a newspaper? If so, which one? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> what's your What's your favourite food? Um, I, uh, I'm trying to eat less meat and failing. I, I, you know, I went on holiday years ago with, with a friend of mine and she's vegetarian and I'm not. And every single night, it was just like a cheap week in the Canary Islands. Every single night she had a green salad. And every single night I had a peppered steak. <laughs> every single seven peppered steaks on the truck. Different restaurants. I mean, we, we moved around, but we always ordered the same thing off the menu. Uh, her a green salad because they didn't have anything else for a vegetarian. And me, because if I see peppered steak on the menu, that's it. Everything else just because just gets edited out. My brain just goes, peppered steak. And and um, so yeah, or a roast dinner. Who is your favorite cultural icon? Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, Paul Newman. I, I struggled with this as well. Paul Newman. I just, just the most extraordinary actor, and just you could put Paul Newman on one side of the screen, and you know, and and a, and a filthy sex scene on the other, and I'd still look at Paul Newman. He's just the most burning presence on on on, on a cinema screen. Just extraordinary. His face. Beautiful man, a beautiful performer. I think he, you can't take your eyes off him. I agree with you. He was great. Those blue yeah. eyes and human yeah. source as well. Um, yes. What's your favourite curse word? And you can say it. And why? Oh, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it again and again. Now, it's, it's got to be fuck. Uh, it's got such uh, sort of versatility to it. I mean, it's, an, it's a noun. It's a verb. It's an expletive. It, it's got, you know, it's a gift. What's your favourite place? Fuck. Or... See, I told you I was going to say it again. And, and again, slipped it in again. Um, what's your favourite place or holiday destination? Um, uh, somewhere with a swim-up bar. I'm, 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 and that's all I want from a holiday. I, I don't want to go mountain climbing. I don't want to take brass rubbings in a local church. Uh, I don't particularly want to learn about local culture. I just want, um, <laughs> I just want some sunshine and alcohol. And, uh, and then I'm happy. And a lilo. And the final three, who's your favourite music artist? And Genesis. Your and your favourite album? Uh, Genesis, I adore. I have uh, signed memorabilia. I'm not just a fan, I'm a super fan. I have everything they recorded. I have bootlegs. I have a gold disc on the wall. Uh, I have, I, you know, uh, so favourite album would be probably Seconds Out, their live album from 1977. When you say Genesis, do you prefer the, the Peter Gabriel era? Or the, I knew the you were going to do this. I knew you were going to do this. I don't care. Yep. They are all Genesis. As long as it's Genesis. Yeah. And of course, they're um, touring, I think, um, due to tour soon. It's been cancelled twice, but yeah. I'm there on September the 20th. What's your greatest achievement to date? Tough I've question. no idea. I've, I, I don't know. I don't know. I've only um, sworn twice in this interview. That, <laughs> that could be it. I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 who, who does know? I haven't got any children. Uh, that I'm aware of and if, if I had that would probably be it um, but I, I don't know and the penultimate question of the interview how do you wish to be remembered um, uh, with a smile that'll do me and there's a there's a there's an actor called Paul Eddington who was in um, Yes Minister and you know mm. The Good Life and things and I think he was asked the question you know what would he like because he died of skin cancer uh, he knew he was dying. He was asked, how would he like to be remembered? And I think he said, you know, he'd like to people to think of him and say he never did anyone any harm. Uh, and I think that's a nice, I, I kind of agree with that. He said, if I'm more eloquently than I did, but yeah, didn't do any, anyone any harm. I think a, a nice way to end today's interview. Thank you kindly for joining me for your take. Wish you all the best with uh, everything. Uh, when things hopefully change touch wood um, more projects come in and I, I hope to see you on stage sometime soon maybe take my kids to to the panto and yeah look forward to to seeing what you do in the future but thank you kindly thank you very much james it's been a pleasure talking to you cinderella should be happening at the theater royal tickets are on uh, on sale now <laughs> and if if people want to find out more about you and your work where where do they go 
got a website. I'm on Twitter. I phone my agent. You know, hang outside the house. I'll come out with the. I'll put the kettle on. I'm around. It's better than the builders hanging outside the house. Anyway. Oh, I'm glad they, they seem to have stopped. Which is thank goodness for that because they are a literal headache. Okay, thank you kindly. And yeah, thanks for joining us today. And yeah, as I said, wish you all the, the very best for the future. Thank you very much. And the same with your channel. Thank you kindly. Mm -hmm.